but interacting organisms at the bacterial level, the archaeal level, and then deeper than that to their mobile elements. And so one of the questions that I'm interested in is how often is this community of microbes sharing genetic information? And how often does that information get transferred to the host as well? And so this talk will mostly focus on genetic information transfer between microbes that co-infect the same host. And just to uh, start with sort of a conceptual framework, I think of the bacterial world in terms of three lifestyles, and this helps to shape our thinking about um, how gene transfer happens across these different lifestyles or ecotypes. So facultative intracellular bacteria, of course, can replicate both inside host cells as well as outside host cells. Extracellular bacteria only replicate outside of host cells in the free living environment. And then an extreme lifestyle, really, is the obligate intracellular bacteria, which only replicate inside host cells. As most of us know, uh, obligate intracellular bacteria show unique genome features. In particular, they indeed represent the smallest genomes of life on average in this sample of 384 genomes that include both free living, facultative, and then all the obligate intracellular bacteria are lumped right here. So, of course, they have small genomes. Many labs have worked on this question. Uh, one other thing that's been well worked on by many labs is that the genomes of obligate intracellular bacteria are fundamentally different from free living and facultative intracellular bacteria. So, if you look at free living bacteria that replicate in the open environment, they have larger genomes and they have genomes that are often populated by the agents of gene transfer viruses, plasmids, and transposons. The obligate intracellular bacteria have, of course, shrunken genomes, and the standard model was that these genomes are clean of mobile genetic elements or horizontal gene transfer. With Irene Newton, who's now at the Indiana uh, University of Bloomington, uh, we uh, looked at hundreds of bacterial genomes across their different lifestyles, and we tested the hypothesis that it seemed uh, to be coming uh, uh, clear to us, which is that Obligate intracellular bacteria, while small, have unique lifestyles. There are those obligate intracellular species that can host switch and move between species hosts. And then there are those obligate intracellular bacteria that are solely vertically transmitted from one host lineage, uh, within one host lineage from parent to offspring, all the time. Well, as it turns out, those obligate intracellular species that host switch almost universally always had mobile genetic illness. And the vertically transmitted species had significantly less mobile elements. And so this indicated to us that something about the horizontal transfer of these microbes conditions them to pick up mobile genetic elements. It also suggested to us that obligate intracellular bacteria, by definition, are not devoid of mobile genetic elements. There are ecological and evolutionary forces that are apparently populating these genomes with mobile elements. And this is the statistic we saw. OK, so to address some of the sort of mechanistic questions of how this element acquisition happens in these tiny, constrained genomes, we use Milwaukee as a model system. And Milwaukee, as it turns out, has 20% of its genome dedicated to mobile genetic elements. In addition, there's a quite active bacteriophage inside the Milwaukee cell. So this is a transmission electron micrograph of a Wolbachia cell. It's about one micron in length. And it's not too interesting except for the fact that you have multiple bacteriophage particles in this Wolbachia cell. In fact, there are about 60 inside the cell right here. And zoomed up, you can see this icosahedral structure and tails of these bacteriophage particles. In the top right here, you see another Wolbachia cell that has no bacteriophage in it. It's kind of granular in structure with multiple membranes. However, right on top of it is a Wolbachia cell that looks different. It has this degraded DNA patch, and it has these bacteriophage particles, in fact, uh, localizing here. And there's even an outside membrane that's become detached and has collapsed towards the inside of the host cell. This is a Wolbachia cell as well, and all these bacteriophage particles are leaving the Wolbachia cell in the act of place. 
as if these particles, in fact, are migrating past this imaginary boundary where the cell would have been closed. Okay. So we have active phage particles, much like a free-living bacteria phage, operating in its obligate intracellular bacteria. This is a little perplexing when we started out, because how exactly does a phage survive and flourish in an obligate intracellular bacteria? There are two barriers to why this might seem difficult. First of all, how does a bacteria phage get inside to a host fly, host animal in this case? And then once in the animal, how does it actually infect an obligate intracellular bacteria? These things obviously have several barriers to infection by bacteria phages. Okay, so our hypothesis is that maybe this isn't so difficult when we think of animals as harboring a community of interacting microbes. And that community is essentially an ecological arena for genetic transfer between co-infections even in the obligate intracellular world. So here are some example hosts, and here's a cell blown up. And these are two obligate intracellular bacteria that co-infect the same host or even the same cell. And this ecological arena would permit transfer of genetic information, particularly phages that we should say. In addition, the ecological arena of a host cell is not a closed arena because facultative intracellular bacteria come and go. So they, in fact, would be the seed or the source of this genetic information, these mole elements, that then populate the obligate intracellular bacteria, particularly the species that host switch, which could frequently encounter novel gene pools and therefore new genetic elements. So as we began this work, we took a single gene phylogenetic approach. And um, in addition to this study published in 2001, we've looked at four other insects that are all co-infected with different types of Wolofia. A and B are highly divergent Wolofia strains. And then there are divergent strains within the B Wolofia uh, that we know these were animals that were co-infected either in natural populations or in the lab. And we can separate out these single infections and ask, do they have the same bacteria phage gene? And to test that, we made a phylogeny of this gene sequence. It's a capsid uh, coding protein gene. And in every case among these five insects, we see that the co-infections have an identical copy of this phage capsid gene. And yet these co-infections are divergent. And so we would not expect this unless there's been recent horizontal transfer whenever you have a co-infection of the body together. And so if that's the case, we next wanted to know how many genes are moving between co-infections in the same cell. Is it just one gene moving through recombination? Or is it whole bacteriophage genomes that are actually moving through the lytic particle from one cell to the next? So we opted to now sequence these genomes to track the extent of the gene transfer mediated by these Wolofia viruses. OK, the way we did that is we opted to develop a, a new technique for sequencing endosomonauts using targeted sequence capture. Essentially, this works uh, as simple as this. You extract uh, DNA as a total homogen, which contains your target symbiont or microbe, and then all the other stuff that's in those cells. With a, an array that has probes that are specific to a genome that you want to capture, in this case, Wolofia, we then trap all the Wolofia DNA onto the array. All the other DNA floats off and doesn't get trapped. This provides a highly selective tool to now enrich for Wolofia genes a loop this off and sequence it on a hydrocode sequencer. So this is a really nice method for sequencing infections in animals and plants. How well does it work? It works extremely well. So 98% of the nucleotides that were captured on the array were in fact linked back to Wolofia. So we were pleased to see this result, not knowing what we'd get. Nisomia, as it turns out, is the host organism which has several gene transfers uh, that have been described in the session already from Wolofia insects, and Nisonia has those. We actually capture those as well. Um, in addition, there's other bacterial stuff from the 16S, 16S ribosomal RNA gene, highly conserved genes. And there's new information that, in fact, uh, has a nucleotide bias, a 34% nucleotide bias towards A's and T's. It's very consistent with Wolofia nucleotide bias. And so we believe this is new information captured with the array that hadn't been annotated in NCBI yet. Okay, the tool works well, but what about the 
biology. Uh, again, these are our two Wolbachia infections. They're about 60 million years in divergence. Do they have the same phage elements? Well, we sequence the whole genomes. You can see a 52 kilobase region here. The genes are intact. It makes a functional and active phage that I showed you in those electron micrographs. The corresponding Wolbachia uh, also has the same gene synthony of this phage, um, except some of the genes are missing because there have been transposon insertions in these yellow boxes that in fact landed into this uh, phage and knocked out the genes around them. So it's a shortened but highly synthetic phage with this one, which we would expect if there's been a recent gene transfer. So one conclusion here is that Wolbachia always transfers between Wolbachia and co-infections. We see that in Nisonia, we see that in the other four insects that have been studied, and we now know that it's happening at the whole genome level. So bacteriophages are promiscuously moving between co-infections, even in the most restrictive class of bacteria that we know of, the obligator cellular bacteria. Um, and I should mention that, going back one slide, the nucleotide identity between these, these genes here is 99%. So it's a highly similar and recent transfer of that. Okay. On the heels of that conclusion, I'm now going to offer somewhat of a contrarian conclusion, which I'll tell you about next, which is that despite this transfer, the genome of this phage flow is in fact constrained by the obligate intracellular lifestyle. Now on one hand, I've just described as lots of transfer. On the other hand, I want to show you that there are constraints to this lifestyle while they can transfer. Okay, so these are 16 uh, phage flow genomes from various Wolbachia strains. And we wanted to ask, is there conservation across the genome? And what are the features that shape the variation across these genomes? As you can see, there are lots of missing portions in some of these genomes. This WO phage is highly prone to deletion, reduction, just like the obligate intracellular bacteria standard model, which is that these bacteria shrink down over time and suffer deletion. Well, this phage does as well. One indication of it. And just to show that in sort of a quantitative way, we looked at the percentage of genes that are common to all these genomes across these various genes. And the only genes that are consistently common, and I don't have an explanation for this yet, is the head and the base flight genes are essentially always in these genomes, despite lots of deletion in the tail regions and in the recombination replication region. So it appears as if there's some kind of selection, in fact, on the head and base plate, for which we don't know the function. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, we have essentially phages that encode for just the head and the base plate, and then we have phages that are active, that we know are lytic and produce um, head, base plate, and then tails. How do we know that? Well, we've done some viral metagenomics, where we've purified out the virus population from our model insect, this wasp nasonia, and then sequenced the viral population DNA. And with the reference genome that already been sequenced, we're able to essentially show that all of the active phages, the ones with reeds, mappable reeds that are in green here, in fact map to the phages with a tail. But those phages that were just head and base plate had very few to no reeds across their reference genome. So again, it's strange to us that these head and base plate genes are maintained, but yet they're not producing active phages. But it tells us that only the ones with the tails are in fact active, which makes sense. Tails are required for infection. Okay, there is new gene acquisition. It's not ex as extensive as the free living bacterial phages, but if you look at these 16 phage genomes from Wolbachia, anywhere between 0 and 10% of the genome is composed of unique genes that aren't in a reference genome that we compared it to. So that means that uh, despite the intracellular lifestyle, there's some new gene acquisition, but it's not extensive, which is also consistent with this constraint on this phages lifestyle. We are able to place the acquisition of these new genes into a preferential category of uncharacterized genes, which makes sense in this, because if you were to think that there are in fact functional aspects to all of these genes, and we don't know the character, you know, the functions of these uncharacterized genes, that that's where the new elements are landing, and perhaps not as disruptive to the phages biology. Thank you. Okay, so we have now recurrent gene transfer of this phage across co-infections. But then we have gene loss and occasional gene uptake. And the combination of these transfers and deletions, as well as new gene uptake, leads to the phages being some of the most diverse 
uh, and information in the Wolbachia genome. Just like in free living bacteria, phages are extremely divergent and cause most of the genome diversification. So we see blocks of uh, divergent DNA. This is a microarray analysis of five Wolbachia strains compared to the Melanogaster Wolbachia. And where there's a blue mark, we see a divergent gene. Where there's a red mark, we see an absent gene. And while there's lots of divergence and absence across these closely related genomes, they cluster where the prophage regions are in these pink regions. And in fact, among these five strains, the, the Wolbachia phage accounts for anywhere between 21 up to 87 percent of all the strain-specific DNA in the Wolbachia genome. So I'd like to sum this up with a schematic. And that is that in the uh, free-living world, we have phages that are constantly moving between different uh, bacterial cells, and there's extensive recombination of genes that happens in this environment. In contrast, we see gene transfer in the obligate intracellular bacteria between interacting and co-infected cells. But these genomes suffer from constraints of the intracellular lifestyle. Not that there's an absence of transfer, but there are transposon insertions, there are rearrangements and deletions that keep these genomes contained and not wildly recombining like free living things. Okay, so just to summarize, I like to think of obligate intracellular bacteria not as binary interactors with their host, but they live in a complex community potentially of other obligate intracellular bacteria that they co infect with, as well as other facultative intracellular bacteria that come and go. And that the cell is not a closed niche, but an open niche potential with potential for gene transfer. In addition, we've shown that when these phages move between obligate intracellular bacteria, there's a whole genome that in fact moves between cells that carries up to 50 kilobases of new DNA, which could provide novel genetic information and functions to these bacterial cells. And finally, just a plug for this tool, it was a very useful for us, and I imagine be very useful for anybody working on bacteria or viruses in general, if they want to purify out their, uh, their microbe, one doesn't need to do extensive and laborious purifications and filtrations. You could just use the current genomic technology to do it. So how important is all this work in the end? Well, I think we should put it in reference and really address that question. We know that the Wachia now has phages. Chlamydia is also an obligate intracellular bacteria that has phages. Those little bubbles with particles popping off of these cells are in fact bacteria phages. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have ancient phage genes involved in transcription and replication that in fact represent ancient phage invasions. So when we look at the most common obligate intracellular bacteria on the planet, that is the organelles and then the most common intracellular species, they in fact have phages. And I think that's the major conclusion that these bacteria, once thought to be streamlined and confined, actually are promiscuous at some level with genetic traits. I want to thank um, all the individuals uh, on, this, on this slide, in particular uh, Irene Newton for some of the comparative genomic work, and my two students, Lisa and Jason, uh, who is about to talk after me. I want to also thank uh, the NSF and the NIH, which uh, make this work possible. Thank you.
poster downstairs that talks about the Catholic. 